Now, I cannot imagine a better or more varied group of scholars uh, to demonstrate just how far Penn has come and just how well positioned we are to continue our leadership into the future than the three Penn and Grace Knowledge professors we have here this morning. And that's a perfect segue for me to introduce our first speaker, whose work is at the absolute cutting edge of science and technology. In 1933, the British physicist Ernest Rutherford was asked about the potential power of the atom. The energy produced by the atom is a very poor kind of thing, Rutherford said. Anyone who expects a source of power from the transformation of these atoms is talking moonshine. Well, with all due respect to the father of nuclear physicists, uh, I think um, our next guest might beg to differ. Christopher Murray has focused his groundbreaking research in chemistry, material science, and engineering on the potential uses of nanocrystals. In other words, he's not simply interested in the transformation of atoms, but in their very creation. And if that's talking moonshine, I think a lot of people are listening. Professor Murray and his team at Penn are at the forefront of nanoscience, creating new building blocks, sometimes called artificial atoms, for materials that don't even exist at this point in time. For example, human-engineered nanocrystals can in turn be organized into one-dimensional uh, nano wires, two dimensional sheets, and three dimensional assemblies. And these microscopic machines could potentially work together as molecular semiconductors, optical sensors, electrical switches, uh, or even medical devices. Of course, that kind of exciting leading edge research presents a number of leading edge environmental and biological challenges. And Professor Murray is well attuned to these challenges and the responsibilities of scientists to consider the real world impact of their discoveries. As he has said, quote, what was a compelling choice at milligram quantities to aid in a particular scientific inquiry may look much less appealing when someone wants to paint your roof tiles with it to harvest energy. Blending perspectives of academic chemistry and material science with a technological background gained uh, through many years of work at IBM Professor Murray continues to advance the world's understanding of nanomaterials. At Penn, he is the Richard Perry University Professor with appointments in the Department of Chemistry in the School of Arts and Sciences and in the Department of Material Science in our School of Engineering and Applied Science. Please join me in welcoming Professor Christopher Murray. Well, good morning, folks. It is truly a pleasure to have an opportunity to come and speak to you today. It is the strength of our extended family at Penn that is one of the key pillars for our current success and our future success. The uh, supportive environment and the successes that, that you all have provided is what brings in the best and brightest in our students uh, each year. And so for that, I actually am very grateful. I'm a newcomer to Penn, as uh, many of the folks that are represented in this uh, present series of presentations today, but I'm the beneficiary of, of many of those efforts. So what I'm going to try to do today is to share with you some of the excitement that we have for the opportunities to begin to engineer materials using chemical approaches that allow us to really go beyond the boundaries of, of traditional building sets uh, that nature had provided. And so, first I have to get you kind of connected to the right length scale, since much of what I'll talk to you about is an effort to organize and engineer materials on dimensions that really are intermediate between the world of chemistry, atoms and, uh, and small molecules, and much of the devices and other components that we generally focus on and in thinking about conventional technologies. And so in this panel, we can begin to uh, look at a ruler that takes us through the world that we live in, beginning to think about the dimensions of the smaller things that are in our physical world, in the animal uh, uh, kingdom with our uh, friends here, ants and mites and other things to occupying this space that just is at the limit of our, our own perception, moving down through the natural length scales of our biological components, even to the size of, of the blood cells and other components that make you and I such complex and beautiful machines in our own ways, 
and ultimately reaching the scale of the, the fundamental building blocks of, of uh, living systems in DNA and other types of components that, again, represent the beauty and complexity of what can be organized in, in natural systems. Paralleling that evolution that has occurred over uh, millions or hundreds of millions of years, we have taken on the challenge of human engineering and design to begin to take things beyond uh, the, the limits of, of sort of mechanical manufacturing on down through microsystems. And I want to take you to a world at the bottom end of this panel where now we have a situation that systems are in competition between two general uh, fields of physical phenomena. The competition is between the world of classical physics, what governs our, our experience in day-to-day -day life in large objects and, and macroscop the macroscopic world, and the, uh, the mysterious world of quantum mechanics where very small systems, atomic systems and other components must conform to the world of statistics and probability rather than the strict uh, determinism of, of uh, classical physics. So you learn about this in your classes and a few folks that have gone through either in the basic sciences or engineering, you've had exposure to this, but traditional textbooks used to treat these as very separate camps. There was one way that you treated the world and then there was this gap that was unknown. It was essentially uh, an area which we had neither the tools to explore nor the techniques to produce systems in that size range. And then you got to the, the chemical components. So I want to talk to you about what we can do when we begin to mix quantum mechanical behavior and, and physical systems and what that might mean uh, for opportunities in a whole area of technologies, in the life sciences, in energy, and in continuing our advances in, in information technology. And so the first part of your class today is to get a little bit of comfort with one of the phenomena in, in quantum mechanics. I know you probably didn't have a plan for that when you were thinking about uh, what you, how you would spend your, your, your typical Sunday. But with the bright students and the engaging folks in, in Penn's community, I know that you're, you're up for the challenge. So in thinking about the materials that we'll build with, you can, we can choose many different systems to work with, but I'll use my example today to be from the world of semiconductors. We all depend on semiconductors and, and we think about the advances that, that many of the conventional technologies have provided us. But now we're going to change the rules a little bit and ask the question, what happens to semiconductors as we begin to shrink down the size of those structures to be comparable to countable numbers of atoms? How do they change their behavior? And so in this image, at the top, you, don't, you will not be quizzed on the equations that describe the density of states for, for these systems, I, I, I do promise. But if you grasp the idea that in, uh, in a system like a semiconductor, there are, level, there are uh, energy levels that determine the interaction of that system with, with, uh, with um, light and with other types of excitations. And in bulk systems, there's a fairly simple relationship in terms of, of how many of these energy levels that are available for a given amount of energy. This is as technical as I'll, I'll actually get. Um, when we think about controlling the dimensions of these objects, we begin to change the rules by which they respond, and we can begin to make systems that are sheets that are, are uh, only a few atoms thick in one dimension, but extend over macroscopic dimensions uh, in the, in the uh, other, uh, other uh, directions. And in that case, we begin to change the properties so that we start to get structure in the electronic response of these systems. As we make something that is a one-dimensional system, we introduce another degree of confinement, so that one of the terms that you'll take away from today is quantum confinement, the process in which we reach down to the quantum mechanical levels uh, for these systems, and the rules for uh, interaction become dominated by things that are described not by simple uh, physical or chemical descriptions, but also the wave functions, the delocalization of, of electrons in the systems. And so it is this world where you're now going to begin to uh, uh, sort of appreciate that matter is, is not the same at all scales. As we begin to reach down to the length scales over which things like electrons tend to move around in, in systems, we begin to change their properties. So these images 
represent, in this case, the, this curve tells you about a phenomena of quantization that you're actually fairly familiar with. If you think about musical instruments, the act of taking a string and place, placing two, uh, two boundary conditions on it, pinning it down, and then plucking it will allow you to hear a particular frequency, a tone. And the music of be beautiful music that we hear is because of the combination of those distinct resonant frequencies. Well, materials have their own resonant frequencies, and those depend on the dimensionality of the system. And so now we're beginning to engineer systems that we can artificially adjust the resonant frequencies of these systems over very broad ranges. So that is the heart of how we're changing a whole set of new technologies. We can take existing materials and give them entirely new properties just by producing them at the right size. That size could be something that is just 10 atoms across, or 20 atoms across, or 100 atoms across. Each one of those structures, even though it was one material, one set of atoms that nature gave us, will give us an entirely new set of responses, an entirely new set of opportunities in terms of what we could do with these pieces. So the panel that I show on the right, uh, I apologize that this is a little crowded, but basically these resonances that you see now are actually, the, these peaks are actually the resonant frequencies of the interaction of light of a, just one typical material, and they are changing as you add just one layer of atoms at a time. So it's the thought experiment. Take one material, add one shell of atoms, see what it does. Add another shell of atoms, see how its properties change. And the challenge for us as chemists and engineers, my, my two hats, is to begin to understand how to choose just the right dimension so that we have the opportunity to optimize the properties that we're going to exploit. Now those properties of tunability and optical uh, systems could have implications in areas that are relatively uh, uh, straightforward in terms of, of, uh, of replacing certain types of optical uh, systems, dyes, and other pieces. One of the applications that has moved very quickly towards commercialization is using little pieces of semiconductor, little quantum dots engineered by quantum confinement to replace relatively fragile uh, organic dyes that are used in a huge number of important processes in, in medical diagnostics. Um, this is an image that shows uh, some brightly colored components where the center of this cell, which would be interrogated to understand perhaps follow some pathological process or just to understand a developmental issue in terms of, of scientific uh, inquiry. Um, these systems that are red at the center are these semiconductor dots. The green uh, system that you see in this panel is a representation of the best-in-class organic dye that is used for the same purpose. Um, what you see as you go across in time is that the organic dye, unfortunately, it works wonderfully in a short time period, but the uh, it is not robust enough to stand up to the intense illumination for longer time periods. The quantum dot systems, these inorganic little rocks that have had their properties engineered to replace the system, are much more robust and offer opportunities to look at much longer time dynamics and other processes. So that's a pretty low-tech application. Really, it, it means that you've taken some quantum physics and just made a better pigment out of it. But it's still valuable. If we think about how even extending that, uh, uh, that uh, line of thought might go, and the possibility that you can begin to engineer properties that go out into the near-infrared, you can begin to make optical materials that are ideally suited for other types of investigations in the life sciences. This happens to be an example of a, uh, a use of imaging techniques with these quantum-tuned uh, uh, particles that have been adjusted so that their emission falls just perfectly in a window in the infrared where your tissue has has stopped absorbing and water that, that surrounds the rest of, of much of uh, the components in your body hasn't started absorbing. It's a, w a window of transparency that allows you to reach deep inside the human body. There are very few uh, conventional dyes or other systems that allow you to access this particular spectral window. And so in this particular image, the opportunity here is to, to take the viewing of a uh, lymph node, a sentinel lymph node, and to image it with this uh, infrared dye to allow real-time navigation by a surgeon to find the extent of, of, of the lymph node and in, in uh, more advanced systems to be able to put molecular tags that actually target particular structures. This work is pushing towards clinical uh, trials in areas of 
helping to better uh, uh, identify the periphery of tumors to allow the surgeons to be able to find exactly what they need to take out and no more material. This is extremely important in terms of minimizing the, uh, the, uh, un the level of of uh, trauma that is associated with a very important procedure in terms of the other uh, surgical procedures. And so these pieces are opportunities where all we've done is just take, uh, found a need where tunability and optical properties can replace some, you know, age-old uh, organic dyes and other types of systems. But if we expand our minds and start thinking about the, uh, the opportunities that are uh, represented in the periodic table, now, for those, again, who have taken basic chemistry, you'll either be uh, cringing a little bit as you see a periodic table again, or you'll, you might respond the way I do with sort of a, a love and a wonder for how nature has organized its own building blocks. But if we take each one of these components that make up the world that we live in, we can begin to think about an analogy where these new nanocrystal-based systems, which are not individual atoms, but they're collections of atoms, where each one can be different the, by just the addition of one extra shell of atoms. That means that each place on this periodic table has now been expanded by hundreds of possible new positions, new sets of properties, new combinations of properties. These are the artificial atoms that we now work with to design materials. Okay? And what's even more exciting for us, and for me in particular in my research, is that we are thinking and, and, and following the vision where we can begin to put these building blocks back together so they not only have the properties in their isolated state, but they actually start to talk to each other. So I mentioned about the length scale of electrons and quantum mechanics and that scary term, a wave function. So we're talking about objects that are small enough that not only are there quantum mechanical phenomena that dictate the internal properties or response of the system, but that quantum mechanical uh, interaction extends beyond the structure and, and leaks out to talk to what's next to it, right? This is what makes atoms the building blocks that transform into molecules because of that strong coupling. We are defining a new chemistry that is based on organized assemblies of tens of atoms, hundreds of atoms, thousands of atoms as the building block, but still we're accessing that quantum mechanical interaction to give us new emergent properties in these systems. So whether you are interested personally in applications that might be as different as photovoltaics or new types of spin coatable transistor uh, materials for low cost electronics, so thinking about quantum confined semiconductors or you're excited about new magnetic phenomena, MRI imaging agents, separation technologies, maybe something that relates to uh, magnetic storage and, and the future, the ultimate limits of, of information storage, which was part of what, what I focused some of my expertise on in the past. And the opportunities to think about taking uh, long established materials, even things as simple as noble metals and coinage materials, and giving them a whole new set of opportunities based on control of dimensionality. Okay, so one of the things that is exciting people in this space, if we can tune electronic properties, we can tune uh, optical response, then we have this chance to take on some very, very hard problems. One of the, uh, the ones that represents a global challenge is photovoltaics and solar energy. And, how do we break some of the paradigms that have restricted us in terms of limitations on efficiency and the cost balance? So there are many good technologies that people are thinking about and trying to work out to address this space. What this area of work on nanoscale materials has suddenly offered is an enormous new set of materials that are untested and untried largely to th at this point for these technologies. But they have these attributes that they can produce new systems that are arbitrarily tunable in their optical response, they are, are uh, widely adjustable in their electronic properties, they can be processed the way you would um, simple pigments or paints by printing processes and other things. So this linkage to make systems of the type that I've, I've shown here, this is actually a thin film of these quantum dots, it's laying at the moment on a semiconductor surface, there are some external contacts. These types of systems are showing just few percent efficiency in laboratory, uh, laboratory experiments now, but the in performance improvements have been, tr dramatic in the, have been dramatic in the last few years. And so these ultra low cost options that might give us a window on how to better optimize the interaction of light 
and conversion to energy is inspiring a lot of activities in this space. So I won't take you into, you know, I, I would lose everybody if I went into circuit diagrams and other things. A few in the audience actually probably have, have even greater depth than I might, I, I would say. It's a very, Penn has such a wonderful breadth in his expertise, represented by you folks as well. Um, but what I would, I would say is that in looking at some of these uh, images, we want to think about having available to us new sets of materials that are organized now where the natural length scale for consideration is the nanometer, one billionth of a meter. And in this case, this is just an organized film, but it happens to have two different constituent materials that are controlled in their size, optimized in their properties, and now they're positioned just right with their neighbors so that their properties begin to interact. Okay? And so this idea of taking the best of what electrical engineering did, electrical engineering took different materials at macro scale and made junctions and connections and squeezed it down, top down, making things smaller, but getting new function because of the interaction, the intersections between material systems. We're trying to take it from the bottom up and use chemistry to produce materials that inherently have all of that function. They have the junctions, the connections, the optimizations of interaction, but they're going to organize themselves the way that natural processes crystallize things rather than relying on much more expensive uh, tooling and techniques to organize them. So if you were to look at what type of tooling was required to produce systems that have this type of, of tolerance in terms of position uh, accuracy, um, the standard deviation in terms of the size of the components and so on, it would be staggering. It, would, it, is, it is greater in this case, in terms of the precision in the other pieces, than the best of semiconductor tooling today. Now, semiconductor tooling has the ability to write arbitrary patterns. It has many other advantages. But we at Penn are thinking about where we can bring soft matter and assembly processes into a wonderful hybrid with microelectronic systems. And so that kind of gives me a segue. I'd like to give you a heads up to one of the more exciting initiatives currently on campus. Uh, on campus, there's a, there is a groundswell of interest from our students and from our faculty to try to address global challenges that re revolve around issues of sustainability. And so we have put together uh, a group of about 50 faculty across the School of Arts and Sciences and the School of Engineering. We have wonderful partners in Wharton as well in terms of some of their efforts in, in sustainability and we're beginning to work and actually it was one of the suggestions from the discussions yesterday, some of the good questions, but there are other links that we still need to make. There's a very early, uh, it's, it, it's early in its operation, uh, but it, it is a powerful new engine for bringing together the talents of Penn to look at a whole area of energy technologies. And so we have expertise now that is focused on these ideas about solution processable photovoltaics we have long-standing expertise in the life sciences that looks at photosynthesis and artificial photosynthesis. We are taking nanoscale materials and looking, I'll give you one quick example in a minute, about direct heat to electric conversion concepts. And I won't take you through all these pieces, but for those who have a passion in this area and they want to think about the future in terms of sustainability, I think you may find some exciting things to, to couple into. If you happen to be parents, there may be some opportunities here where your, your, uh, your uh, kids might be very excited about the research opportunities that come from this experience. And actually, that's one of the pieces I would like to, to stress as well. One of the wonderful things about Penn as a faculty member is getting a chance to work with so many talented undergraduates. In any given year, I have, uh, I have about 10 undergraduate students across the two schools that come and do work with a high degree of independence in terms of the choice and carry that out in my lab. And that experience of working with the students and seeing how much they can contribute and how it energizes them going on in their future studies, that's a big part of what we offer in terms of providing that very fertile environment. So again, thank you for your support in the aspects of, of helping us to build that community. And for those who are the new uh, admits in this area, I would encourage you to think about across the spectrum of what Penn does, get involved and get involved early in terms of these uh, opportunities. So I'll just give you one example because it kind of highlights how we may be able to break the paradigm of performance in, in, in certain areas of energy conversion. It has been a long-standing challenge to come up with solid-state ways to convert thermal energy to electrical energy. Thermoelectrics and uh, systems that have allowed us to do that have existed for literally 100 years, over. And the performance enhancements in that area have been very, very slow. 
And that's because we were working with a set of materials that nature had allowed us uh, to access as stable compounds and other pieces. Over the last, uh, the last 10 years or so, the performance in these systems, and I'm sorry, it's a rather arcane sort of unit in here. The, this is the, uh, the efficiency uh, coefficient. Uh, basically, we spent about 60 years where this number was just about one, okay? The mark of the figure of merit for these systems. In the last 10 years, with the enhancements of introduction of nanostructured systems, we've seen reports and now demonstrations that have, have uh, more than doubled the performance at conversion efficiency. And what that means in reality is that we are approaching a stage in developing materials that could take the energy from heat, use the properties of the semiconducting composite systems to allow you to produce energy that could capture some of the waste heat that is generated by many other processes, industrial processes. Things as simple and actually now practical are demonstrations of these systems that have been attached to the, to the exhaust systems of cars. About 70% of the energy that goes into your car goes out as heat. Only 30% actually goes into uh, true propulsion. If you could capture just a little bit of the value of that waste heat coming out of your, uh, out of your uh, tailpipe, you can make real contributions to the overall mileage efficiency or to the onboard electronic systems and so on. So Mercedes, uh, uh, BMW, and others have already seized on this and these advances in materials to say this might be an opportunity for us to do better in terms of our components. So there are many parameters to optimize to make these systems effective. There are, there are issues in, in integration. I know uh, I, I'm very well, uh, uh, a very uh, respectful, having been in industry for a long time, that a really good idea in terms of some aspects still faces a lot of challenges to bring it all the way through to processing and stability and all these pieces. But one of the nice things at Penn is the connection between the different schools allows you to contribute to the very fundamental science of generation of materials that had never existed before and to couple with people in aspects of engineering and the applied areas that do link to industry, that do link to the ultimate customer so that you can really do the right things to, to try to shepherd along a technology. So this is an example of taking these artificial atoms, building blocks of two different types, organizing them together and I apologize, this is kind of a, a, a slightly less pretty image because it's, it was a large chunk. It was sort of like about a centimeter across. And you know, we have to make really uh, decent sized quantities for some of the tests of these systems. So uh, the material that was used in this test would cover uh, quite a few square meters of the devices that we were going to uh, ultimately work on. But in this system, um, we were able to demonstrate that we could improve uh, the important parameters for this system, lowering thermal conductivity, increasing electrical conductivity by three orders of magnitude relative to one important uh, reference state of pure material or by two orders of magnitude coming from the other state. So we still have to come up with processing. There are a lot of other issues in these pieces, but it is an example of where you're not looking at improvements of performance in the dimensions that are a few percent. They are very large leaps in terms of, of the properties of the system. Now, how you optimize those is going to continue to be a challenge, but it makes us very excited about how we might intersect a variety of energy-related technologies. And I'll be careful because I really want to have more time for, for questions in this piece. I learned a lot from the other events in this component. But I will, I will ask you to think about for those who've uh, taken uh, any aspect of physics or been uh, exposed to optics, just a moment to, to think also about how we can change dramatically our thinking about an area that, in this case, goes back hundreds of years, if you think about classical optics and other, other components. Um, right now, the textbooks on optics are being rewritten. They're being rewritten because one of our assumptions in the past had been that no material could have what was referred to as a negative index of refraction. We have the experience in our own lives of seeing perhaps a straw sitting in a, in a, a, a glass of water and seeing refraction, the bending of that straw. So classical optics describes that very well. But suddenly, if you were to see that straw bending back in the opposite direction, you'd be a little mystified about you know, what was happening in that system. Well, that would mean that you had basically immersed it in a material that had a negative index of refraction. It had bent the light back uh, in, in, uh, in ways that previously we thought had violated fundamental laws. We've now learned that it doesn't actually violate any fundamental laws. It's just the fact that materials that had these combinations of responses 
for their interaction with electromagnetic radiation. They just hadn't been discovered yet. They hadn't been designed yet. And it's because they weren't at the right scales yet. And so one of the things that is very exciting in this space is to realize that small metal particles have the possibility of, of contributing to this design of new optical materials that can bend light in, in extreme ways. Okay? The, uh, the other concept, we mentioned quantum mechanics and quantum confinement. Now you're also going to know about plasmonics. So plasmonics is the phenomenon in which extremely small metal structures suddenly begin to develop distinct resonances with light because of the confinement of their electrons to the surface of that object. Basically, the electrons that are at the surface of this little piece of metal just get tuned to the right frequency so that they're, be, they're able to resonantly interact with light. And so what that does is it takes a, a long known material with a certain set of properties we thought we understood completely and now allows us to have a, a new tuning parameter to, op, uh, to, to change its properties. And it turns out, actually, that this interaction with light through the plasmon gives this property of actually ha potentially helping to bend light back in the opposite direction. What could that mean? What could it mean if we had this breaking of the paradigm in terms of, of traditional optics? Well, Nader and Gaeta has uh, been a leader. He is uh, one of Penn's uh, contributors in electrical engineering, a uh, fantastic uh, uh, champion for this area of plasmonics and nanophotonics and other pieces. And so one of the areas that he's looked at uh, really does sound like science fiction. Um, for those who are a little bit uh, 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 more geeky in the audience, like myself perhaps, you think about cloaking devices, um, hearkening back to the best episodes of Star Trek or something like that. And, you know, we went through so much of our lives thinking that, that these are really crazy concepts, right? But actually cloaking, the ability to bend light entirely around an object and re-image what is on the opposite side, that now has been shown to be true in principle at many wavelengths. At microwave frequencies, Nader has been a leader in, in, in designing systems that can actually take an object and find ways to allow light to bend completely around that object so that it, it does not impede the, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, transport of, of those photons. And therefore, the object becomes completely invisible. Now, you can imagine that he is well supported and, and uh, there's a lot of interest in the military in some of these areas. And the, uh, the opportunities for stealth and other technologies are certainly very important ones. But what it really means for us is now we're able to bend light at extreme angles over very small distances and it opens the possibility of doing nanoscale routing of light, much smaller than the natural wavelength of light, orders of magnitude smaller, and it opens a new possibility in the energy frontier that we mentioned. Some of the ideas about conversion of, of solar energy to usable energy, electrical energy and so on, have been limited by the fact that there are no practical means to concentrate light to begin to harvest the benefits, to harvest light with the benefits of nonlinear processes, things that only happen at extremely high ten, uh, intensities. And so some of the concepts here in developing systems that can begin to uh, uh, concentrate life much smaller than its natural wavelength and to develop imaging optics that aren't limited by, again, for those in, in physics or had this exposure, there was this term diffraction limit. That was the classical dimension where you couldn't make light any smaller because it just wanted to be uh, classically, uh, quantum mechanically uh, uh, dispersed over that area. So what it turns out is that these systems could allow us to make what are referred to as perfect lenses, to actually take light and focus it to any arbitrary intensity. And that can radically change what we might do with uh, the conversion possibilities in, in energy. All right. So we're building with different compositions. We're building with new sets of, of, uh, of geometries and shapes. And this is opening up a lot of exciting opportunities for applications. It's also opening up many uh, exciting opportunities in terms of the, uh, the, the potential responsibility for understanding how these materials uh, will work in the environment and full life cycle analyses and other pieces. All right, I would like you know, our class is now taking you through several major changes in how we think about the physical world. Right? And it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to turn over to, uh, to questions and begin to start an exchange that I hope will continue through to the end of the program in terms of 
of, uh, of uh, us learning from the folks here in, in, uh, and, and their interests. So with that, I will thank you for your attention and I will uh, invite any questions or comments on uh, what, what is a tough subject to, to, to chemistry and, and materials engineering, tough subject to, to broach it, uh, uh, on a Sunday afternoon. I'll answer one question which I might otherwise get from the audience, which is what takes us to the next level in terms of nanoscience and technology? And so we have underway at this time the plan to transform our infrastructure to contribute in this area. This is the space on the corner of 33rd and Walnut. There's a parking lot and a, and a small structure in the back here. You may have seen in the, in the lobby some of the visionary plans of how the Singh Center for uh, nanotechnology uh, may be positioned. This is a, a world-class facility that will allow us to take pen strengths in soft matter, the life sciences, intersect those with the best of techniques in fabrication and integration. It will be the home for world-class tools and the draw for world-class talent that we're going to need to be competitive in the next generation of science. And so I would invite you back uh, to Penn at any time, but I hope that you will be able to come back, see the progress in this effort, which is a multi uh, is a, a joint effort between SAS and SEAS, but it re represents one of the real quantum leaps that we are making in terms of our ability to compete at the highest level in, in this area. So again, thank you, Amy, for the opportunity, and I'll take any questions. Yes. Um, on a the question is, when, if ever, will fuel cells be efficient and practical, and uh, can you give some examples of that? So uh, it's an excellent question. So there's important work that's, that's going on in many different types of fuel cells, some excellent work actually at Penn, some leading work in, in high temperature solid oxide based fuel cells that provides one of our cores. So those systems can be competitive with other uh, utility scale uh, 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 generation schemes. However, they don't have the benefit of the extremely long history of testing and reliability. So reliability in the utility industry is everything. No one will forgive you if your power goes out, right? And so it's a very conservative industry. So there the technology is maturing, but, but it's an issue of just really making it bulletproof at the larger scale. Um, one of the other pieces, there are some very exciting developments in terms of new polymeric materials for improved transport for low weight uh, uh, fuel cells. And, the, and I think you'll see a lot of changes in the next probably five years or so, partly because consumer electronics and some other technologies, micro-scale fuel cells, are really making their way into the marketplace and beginning to get attention. So we have scientific uh, advances that are being stimulated from multiple markets rather than just one uh, that had been the previous driver. So exciting things are happening. Fuel cell efficiencies can be 60% or more, depending on the design and the ability to recover. So those are really uh, something that has to be part of the mix in terms of how we think about our energy future. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Uh, will you please elaborate on the use of nanotechnology in oncology? Oh, absolutely. So actually, that's one of, I, I'm the beneficiary. So in oncology, there are tremendous opportunities, both in diagnostics, but also in therapeutic applications, drug delivery applications, other pieces. So we've been thrilled, I've been thrilled with my move to Penn. Because of the strength of the medical school, we actually have active programs now that link us to researchers in ovarian cancer. And we're looking at magnetic-based uh, nanoscale therapies for ovarian cancer, both to enhance detection, but actually more importantly, to provide an opportunity for remote excitation to, to better, better allow some hyperthermal treatment. So using RF, if you want to think about putting, if you've ever put a fork in a microwave accidentally, um, you, can un, you can appreciate how nanoscale little pieces of metal with the right design and the right resonance might allow you to locally heat um, uh, something that's targeted. Um, we also work with folks using uh, the optical properties of some of the systems we make to target uh, the, uh, the possibilities in photodynamic therapy. That's largely uh, uh, targeting mesothelioma and a, a number of, uh, of lung cancer related phenomena. Um, but the, the, tra the challenges are great, but I appreciate the question because um, nanotechnology is so broad and it's used really across such a large range, it's very hard to get a sense of what it actually means. Really, it just means all technology being pushed down to the precision that approaches atomic precision. So thank you. Uh, yes. When, could you describe how you merged the 
college student and the graduate student into your research projects. Who else is involved? What professional researchers? And then how do you uh, coordinate or do you coordinate with industrial research and other universities' research? So science is inherently collaborative across all boundaries. And actually one of the things that is wonderful about being at Penn with its strengths is we become high value partners to other very strong institutions. So we have a lot of links that, that bring that piece together, but they happen without any particular plan. It really is a grassroots sort of connections that are made there. The question about how we integrate uh, researchers, I really like that because it's one of the wonderful things about the experience of putting graduate students and undergraduates together to, to work in the laboratory that has been so rewarding for me. The undergraduates bring the strengths of, the, uh, of their experience at Penn. Often they can contribute that to graduate students that could be coming from anywhere in the world. They contribute in many ways in terms of each learning from each other. Um, but again, it's not very structured. It really is that students come in, they have an interest, we have expertise and capabilities. We show them a range of areas they could contribute to. There's always so many more projects that you'd like to work on than you can possibly have the resources for. So there's really no limitation in terms of providing uh, a buffet and they can sort of choose a little bit of what they like in their experience. So um, it's a good question because bringing people in and doing it uh, effectively with good mentoring is an important part of Penn's success. But there isn't really a, a rigid formula that any, any group might uh, uh, sort of adhere to to allow that to happen. Thank you. Yeah, maybe a question here. Yes. Does nanotechnology have application to large scale things like <coughs> construction or aerospace building Absolutely. or that kind of thing? You know, actually, it's a great question because. Often we think about nanotechnology that really comes out of the labs that we're thinking about the ultimate limits of microelectronics, miniaturization, other pieces. But there's this whole other stream of nanotechnology which is actually better aligned with the bulk chemical producers of the world. For them, the idea of producing, uh, literally, I have people that come to me and they want to produce you know, uh, railroad cars full of the types of materials that we do. It's a huge leap and we're trying to work with people in chemical engineering and other things to help to make that happen. But there, is, there are techniques that are scalable for the production of these materials that allow you to make them at the scale that, that you would think of for many other construction materials. Things that coat surfaces to allow, for example, um, uh, self-cleaning surfaces on windows with nanoscale coatings are currently commercial systems. Uh, that, things that help to remediate pollution, air pollution, by thin coatings on other systems. Actually, part of what makes the, B, uh, the uh, B2 stealth bomber um, function is actually nanoscale materials and combinations that we've talked about that is the stealth coating of those systems. Early generations of them were a little environmentally uh, uh, sensitive, but actually um, it is quite reasonable to think of these advances at the laboratory scale translating to become one more part of our bulk materials production and our construction opportunities. It's actually a very hot topic. Thank you for that. Cheers. Thank you.